Dear students, Madam Vice Dean, dear members of the Hong Regional Foundation, dear faculty and TAs, dear Geneva Academy admin colleagues, dear family members, and to summarize, dear friends, welcome to the graduation ceremony of the Geneva Academy for the academic year 2019-2020. I am very happy to announce that 79 students and participants made it this year and succeeded in one of our three master's programs. The LLM in International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights, the Master in Transitional Justice, and the Executive Master in International Law and Armed Conflicts. And you did it in the middle of a particularly challenging year. Uh, the fact that we have been unable to hold this ceremony in person uh, because of the surge of the second wave of the COVID pandemic in Switzerland is a further reminder, if needed, of the tectonic changes that have been brought to our lives in 2020. But despite the social distancing, the masks, the closure of borders, the quarantines, we are together. We are together and united around the success, your success, and a project, our project, to train the humanitarian intelligentsia and leaders of tomorrow. As you have seen on the program, uh, we have a lot in front of us. But before that, as the new director of the Geneva Academy and as an alumna, please let me share with you a few thoughts about the Geneva Academy. To me, the Geneva Academy resonates with three key words. First, excellency. The Geneva Academy excellency is evidenced by the amazing profiles of our students and also by the excellent academic results they obtained in our masters. For instance, in the LLM and MTJ, I have calculated that we have 49 students out of 58 graduating with honors meaning summa cum laude, magna cum laude, or cum laude. And I can tell you that this is not because professors are being nice. On the contrary, we are actually, we have actually a very demanding and select faculty with professors coming from the most prestigious institutions around the world, including the University of Geneva and the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies. These students, I know you have been working hard, spending hours reading jurisprudence, analyzing different academic theories, trying to put together the knowledge acquired through various courses, identifying gaps in the law, striving to find meaningful solutions from a legal perspective and to devise policy recommendations. It was hard, but believe, believe me, it was worth it. When I read the nine LLM papers for the selection of the Henri Dunant Prize and for the selection of the best LLM paper, I was extremely impressed. Impressed by the academic level of the contributions, which for many could easily be published with a few adaptations. I was also impressed by the originality of the topics and of the approach taken. Lastly, I was thrilled to see that most of these excellent papers were not simply confined to analyzing an issue under one body of law. You break the silos in international law. You are not simply an IHL technician ignoring the evolutions of human, human rights law. You are not either a human rights lawyer forgetting the reality of armed conflicts and the detail of universally accepted norms of IHL. You are true international lawyers. You are able to analyze a humanitarian issue from the perspective of various bodies of law, international criminal law, IHL, human rights law, refugee law, and others. And this is where I believe the training offered by the Geneva Academy is really unique. And this is why your profiles are sought and needed. The second key word with which the Geneva Academy rhymes for me is agility. Despite the COVID pandemic, uh, the Geneva Academy as a whole, under the lead of our former director, Professor Sassoli, has been able to adapt extremely rapidly. 
Last spring, from almost one day to the next, all courses went online. The professors adapted their courses to the Zoom format. The TAs supported both students and professors who are at times a bit lost with new technologies, at least here I speak for myself. But you, dear students, you played the game without complaining and you maintained a high level of motivation despite the challenges. Adaptation to the COVID pandemic and conversion to online teaching when necessary or useful is just one example, obviously. More broadly, the Academy consistently strives to adapt to current events and challenges in international law. Once one of our TAs told me that the following, that in his country, where he studied before, he was taught public international law on the basis of textbooks from the 90s or 2000s. And he said, well, when I joined the academy, I learned the challenges in the interpretation and application of IHL, human rights law, international criminal law, based on what is happening now. Why? Because our, stu our professors are really at the forefront of legal developments. So I think that this is a very beautiful des testimonial. And last but not least, uh, the Geneva Academy rhymes with humanity. Despite the diversity of the masters and programs conducted at the Academy, we all work with the same objective in mind, bringing more humanity to our world, before, during, and after armed conflicts and other situations of violence. What makes me get up in the morning is to see that the students of the Academy want to acquire tools in particular legal tools, with a view to offer protections to individuals, victims of armed conflicts, and to bring hope and a future to communities that need to rebuild their lives and countries. I really do hope that you, dear students, will keep this motivation and dedication and will continue to strive to locate respect for international humanitarian law and human rights law at the center of the international community's concerns. This is not an easy task at a time where security and economic concerns are at the forefront, but you are not alone. Remember, the Academy is like an extended family and you have cousins, I mean by that alumni, all around the world and working for the UN, the ICSC, NGOs for various states. So don't forget the friendship and networks that you've been able to build in Geneva and help each other in finding your dream jobs and also in overcoming professional and other challenges. Solidarity is also part of humanity. And with that, I will give the floor to the Vice Dean of the Law Faculty of the University of Geneva, Professor Maya Hertig. Maya, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, in the name of the law faculty of the University of Geneva, I wish you a very warm welcome to this graduation ceremony. Like most of you, I would have preferred to be with you physically and to celebrate your accomplishments and this very joyful moment with a toast whilst having the opportunity to intermingle with you, exchange with you, get to know some of you. Nevertheless, this evening and this ceremony is a joyful event, an uplifting event at a time which is not very uplifting, to say the least. Successfully completing a highly demanding program like the different master programs offered by the Academy, demands a lot of work, determination, and unwavering motivation. Completing such a program at times of uncertainty, working partly remotely as you had to do, demands even more work, more determination and more motivation and the ability to adapt. You have risen to these challenges and I would like to warmly congratulate you for that. Congratulations are I think also in order to the former and current director of the Academy, my colleagues Marco Sassoli and Gloria Gaggioli, as well as all the other staff of the Academy. They were and are the captains who have kept the sh this ship of the Academy on course. 
they help to they help to steer it through troubled waters, and I may be tempted to say through the storms or possibly more accurately the waves of the pandemic and all the challenges, logistic, financial, organizational, legal, which go hand in hand with it. Gloria Gadjoli will play the challenging role of captain also during this academic year, so, so that next year a new group of students will be in your shoes and be able to celebrate the successful completion of their studies. But let's return from the future to tonight, which is your night. New graduation from the Academy is a cause for celebration, not just for you, but for much wider circles. The Academy, its founding institutions, the Graduate Institute and the University of Geneva, and communities far beyond. All of you have been selected to the programs based on academic and personal credentials, and you have immersed yourself during one year into IHL, international human rights law, in transitional justice, and more broader areas of international law. I don't think it needs much elaboration why your expertise will be needed looking at today's world. Being a member of the ICRC, I hear much about the current and future challenges we are facing. The world is not getting more peaceful, conflicts are getting more complex, with an increasing diversity of actors involved. Conflicts are getting more protracted and new forms of threats and warfare come along. Innovation is of course not new and has marked the history of warfare. In his memory of Solferino, Henri Dunant already highlighted, I quote, if the new and frightful weapons of destruction which are now at the disposal of the nations seem destined to abridge the duration of future wars, it appears likely, on the other hand, that future battles will only become more and more murderous. So battles are becoming more murderous. I'm not sure that the wars are getting shorter. But to return to the point I was making, innovation has always been there. But I think uh, nowadays the speed of in innovation and the potential for new forms of warfare is unprecedented. The world needs lawyers capable of, to think out of the box with strong analytical and critical skills, lawyers with an original and agile mind. Henri Dunant invited us to take advantage of a time of relative calm and quiet to investigate and try to solve a question of such immense and worldwide importance. In an accelerating world, the window of quiet, calm times may be shrinking, calling, as mentioned, for agile minds capable of responding to challenges fast. To respond to new challenges, society needs lawyers who are sufficiently specialized within an area of expertise, in your case, IHL, international human rights law, transitional justice. But at the same time, we need lawyers with a broader vision, with openness to other areas of law, be it refugee law, international criminal law, data protection, to name just a few areas which are relevant for the humanitarian sector. So we need to break silos, as uh, Gloria Gadjoli already mentioned. Studying at the Academy has, I believe, equipped you well for, with the skills and mindset much needed today. Whether you will be working for the government, for a civil society organization, an international organization, as practicing lawyers, or whether you remain in academia, I know you will be driven by the desire to promote the values of IHL. Sorry, I can just hear someone talking. Is that normal? Or you can hear me still. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So I just thought some technical problem had occurred. So I will say I know you will be committed to the values of uh, international human rights law. Gloria was saying peace. I think it's justice as well and many other values. I hope that you will not, that not only the skills, knowledge and mindset you have acquired during the studies at the Academy, but also all the friendships you have made will accompany you for a long time to come. Again, in the name of the Law Faculty of the Geneva University, my most sincere congratulations to all of you 
And I am handing now the, the word back to Gloria Gajoli. Thank you very much, Maya, for this beautiful and thoughtful introduction. Thank you. We really do appreciate it. Now I, I give the floor to the MTJ directors. So Thomas, Thomas Unger and Frank, Frank Alderman, who are at the Villa Moigne in the Cassese room. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Gloria. And uh, good evening uh, to all dear students of the MTK, but also dear students of the MN program. Uh, this is obviously a, a sad and a happy day the same time. It is a sad day because uh, we see uh, students leave, students we have worked with uh, a whole year, we have get, got to know uh, very well, uh, we have uh, spent time, debates, discussions, uh, shared a lot of concerns, but also happy moments. And it's a sad, sad, sad moment to, to kind of acknowledge that and, 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 uh, and to say we have to move on. It's, but it's also a happy moment because it's a happy moment because uh, one had the opportunity uh, to contribute to shape uh, the next generation of transitional justice activists, experts, lawyers. Uh, and that's a privilege. That's a privilege not many people have. And uh, let me say a few words about shaping the future. I think what is important and what you have demonstrated in the class, uh, in debates, how you are interested in spotting the dilemmas, in asking the right questions, the uncomfortable questions, the questions that dig deeper into the topic. Uh, you didn't let go of, uh, of the, 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 the ordinary. You wanted to know more. And I wish you the courage to continue doing this in your professional life. You should not administer transitional justice, you should shape transitional justice. And I hope that you will be able to do that. Second, I think you have demonstrated yourself that you are able to shape. Uh, you have demonstrated this through the virtue of solidarity, of compassion to your students in very difficult moments, through teamwork. And these are all virtues, I think, that will help you to be a shaper and not an administrator. So all the best to you uh, in the future. Um, uh, please don't forget us. As Gloria said, we are a family. You always can come back to us. Please knock at our doors. And with this, I want to hand over to my friend and colleague, Frank. Thank you, Thomas. You have heard already that you have been through a very special year this time, very much overshadowed this year by the pandemic. But I think it's important not to let this pandemic overshadow the, the year. And so I thought with Thomas together to think a little bit differently, perhaps more positively about this year. And, uh, and we realized that throughout this year, the year you stayed at the Geneva Academy, there has been a remarkable number of civil movements for change. So um, think, for instance, just to start with, to give some examples, think of the Green Movement. You have seen young people, teenagers, walking through the streets and protesting peacefully in the name for uh, more awareness for um, climate change issues. Think, for instance, of Hong Kong, students protesting for peace and justice and, and democracy. Think more recently of Belarus, the same, people risking their lives in the name of democracy and their rights. And think also more recently perhaps, I think also of, um, of the Black Lives Matter movement, which involved many people who were earnest and are committed to, um, to the cause of a better, more just, non-racist society. And think finally of Chile. Thomas shared with me uh, a, a couple of days ago a wonderful video from December, I think, 2019, where you see Chileans, thousands of Chileans in Santiago de Chile listening to a song which says, if you are united, you will not be defeated. That happened in December 2019. And only a couple of months later, we have Chileans actually voting for a new constitution which breaks with the past, which breaks with the constitution from the from the dictatorship days. So these are just so, some examples, I think, which show that there are these movements out there, civil movements, which I think reflect a little bit what uh, Martin Luther King said once about justice and about struggle. He said in his wonderful book of um, which he wrote, his wonderful letter, which he wrote from the Birmingham letter, from the Birmingham jail, he said, 
I'm against, I'm opposed to a violent struggle, but I'm not against non-violent struggle in order to change the world because progress is not inevitable. Progress has to be, you have to be committed to progress and that's how it happens. And he said also, and I finish with it on that line, he said also that probably, probably the problem is sometimes that the silence of the good people, as he called them, is in the way of progress. So my hope and our hope would be that you could become involved in one way or another in these movements for change, wherever you might be, whatever you might do. We thank you for this year we could spend with you and wish you all the best. And as Thomas said, let's stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank and Thomas, for this lively talk and for linking uh, what you study at the, NTJ, at the MTJ with current events. I'm sure that our students will be able to shape the debate and shape our future. So now I'm happy to introduce three of our former students who are graduating and who will share their experience with us. So we'll start with Chanel Chauvet from the LLM. Uh, then we will have Anna Katunyan from the MTJ and last but not least, Rabah Al Juma from the Executive Master. So, Chanel, you have the floor. Good, good evening, everyone. Director, professors, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow colleagues that cannot be here in Geneva due to coronavirus restrictions and constraints. I am humbled and honored to be able to participate in the 2020 graduation as a class speaker on behalf of the students in the LLM program in International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. This graduation is certainly unique because it is the first one where we've not been able to have our family present in person. However, when I revealed the news to my younger brother about the restriction, he was thrilled not to have to travel all the way to Switzerland. For many of us in this program, we've known it to be a tremendous labor of love, one in which we have intensely studied two fields in which we are so passionate under rigorous sets of standards and expectations. As the months pass, we grew, and we learned to not allow external circumstances to define us. With that said, it's impossible to quantify the endurance this past year has required between a global pandemic in which we were apart from our families, uh, coursework and job hunting in such a diff difficult climate, and Fabrizio and Juan's jokes, we managed it. <laughs> Over the next few minutes, I'd like to briefly discuss what we've learned and the people we have to thank. In the past year, in this international program, we as Geneva Academy students have learned so much about the world, not only through our study of law, but also through each other. For many of us, meeting people from different cultures for the first time, we operated as representatives for our communities, both in success and in failure, and we overcame stereotypes about our backgrounds and societies. We explored and celebrated our differences, which was such an incredible aspect of this program. We also developed bonds and extracurricular activities, including webinars given by our fellow classmates about their past work, which allowed us to capitalize on the experiences of our fellow colleagues, such as Lisa Borden and Natalia Elfimova. We forged bonds with each other at various events, including our Christmas party, where Sarah brought the most beautifully arranged holiday tray, and Viviana and Juana showed us some moves. Birthday outings for Helena, Omar, and Virginia, uh, the study trip arranged by Melina, Fabrizio, myself, uh, where we learned about the armed conflict that took place, and Ava shared her beautiful singing talent. Boat rides with Stella, Just Jeet, and Michael, and military briefings coordinated by our wonderful teaching assistant, Pavle. Because we have spent so much time together, we have built a network of colleagues that will advocate for each other, even when we're halfway across the world from each other. Today solidifies the fact that we have made an intentional choice to live a life of use to others, to advocate, to listen, and to be that support as allies, whether it be to those suffering from armed conflict or the effects of armed conflict, refugee crises, or human rights violations. Lawyers are leaders in our society. And as we are trained in law, we're the ones best equipped to advocate for causes that may inspire change to ensure that all human beings are treated with dignity and respect. Because of this program, we are prepared to stand in the gap of what is 
and what should be under IHL and human rights and work to narrow that gap. When we advocate for change to displace previously held norms that had seemed invincible before, the world will adapt. We have seen such changes as a result of advocacy and the way that people and governments are acknowledging their roles, either actively or passively, and the discrimination of other people, specifically against civilians under human rights in IHL, against women, and most currently against Black people, brought to light by the Black Lives Matter movement, which seeks equality in the United States and other societies. Graduation represents a brief moment in our lives where we relish the memories of our educational experience and confront our dreams and the uncertainties of the future. This Master of Law degree grants us the experience, access, information, opportunity, uh, and a host of other resources to create a career path that is focused on service in our respective fields. With that said, we must remember the trials that accompanied this achievement. There is a history and an ancestry to each and every one of us who struggled courageously so that we might have the opportunity to make it as far as we've come. Like many of you, I had never envisioned that I would one day study in Switzerland of all places, the birthplace of the Red Cross and probably the birthplace of cheese as well. <laughs> today, we celebrate that journey and this graduation ceremony. While our time together here has passed, we can take solace in the fact that the best is yet to be and hope that our future work exemplifies even a fraction of the contributions to the fields of IHL and human rights that our professors, faculty, and teaching assistants have made over the course of their own careers. Thank you all. And thank you additionally to our families, mentors, and close friends who have helped us tremendously in this achievement. Stay safe and healthy and congratulations everyone. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Chanel. That was a very beautiful speech. Now we will have uh, Anna Katsunian from the MTJ. Good evening, directors, professors, classmates, and all others who are joining this ceremony today. My name is Anna Teresa, and I'm honored and humbled to be here to speak on behalf of the class of 2020 of the Masters in Transitional Justice, Human Rights, and the Rule of Law. I would like to first thank Professors Unger and Haldeman, coordinators of the Masters program, the teaching assistants, Augustina and Tafatsua, and the administrative team, Danny and Lucy, for their support during this year. Without you, it wouldn't have been possible. Thank you as well to all my classmates for the moments shared, and especially Nancy, Diana, and Nana, our class representatives, who provided so many extracurricular sessions that and organized our trip to Kosovo, where Valza so promptly received us. This year, we've gone from online theater presentations through to Zoom meetings and debates on colonialism to writing dissertations and most certainly calibrating the degrees of our classes. What a year. It seems like yesterday that younger and more eager versions of ourselves gathered to meet for the first time. After many discussions, heated academic debates, informal encounters, and late nights at the library, we were no longer just colleagues. We had become friends. Grasping the dimension of the differences among, our, among ourselves, throughout the year we learned that attending this program was a conscious choice with different consequences for each of us. Some had to distance themselves from their children, some lost a loved one, and in the middle of countless reading and classes, went through a profound grieving process until they were able to return to the group. And while most of us went to numerous events at international organizations, others were halted because of where they were born. Some saw love flourish unexpectedly, and others watched with desperate eyes as their hometown neighborhoods were raised to the ground just a few days before the deadline of our thesis. Some saw their friends and acquaintances adhere to mandatory conscription for war, and others would be able to return safely to their homes upon completion of the program. Among all of this, few of us could have, could have imagined that our second semester would be almost entirely online because of a global pandemic. There is still room for one dose of perplexity, but also two doses of action. When looking back, I can only think of one thing. This is the curious experience of life, and I'm thankful we can face it together. Everything happens at once, 
it's messy, and we often can't reach the unrealistically high expectations of ourselves. We live in a constant effort to juggle our personal and professional spheres. But we're also lucky because we have great humane examples to look up to and peers to grow with. Which brings me to when I was 10 years old and I found a book, old rusty book with yellow pages in my basement. And my dad told me that this book was called The Prophet. He said that it was a book that eternally updated itself without changing, which at the time to me seemed like a willful paradox and the result of a poor choice of words. But rightfully so, this book has accompanied me, accompanied me throughout the years, and it was to it that I recurred to in my saga to search for words to describe the force which I saw in the eyes of the members of the Geneva Academy. I found them, and these are Gibran Khalil Gibran's words. Work is love made visible, and if you cannot work with love, but only with distaste, it is better that you should leave your work and sit at the gate of the temple and take alms from those who work with joy. For if you bake bread with indifference, you will bake a bitter bread that feeds only but half a man's hunger. And I know this, this seems cheesy, I can feel it through the camera, but I did see love in my classmates' eyes when we debated. I saw it in Professor Unger's eyes when he spoke of his family story and what brought him to TJ. I saw it in Professor Haldeman's expressions when he patiently explained the slightest differences in TJ theory with unparalleled dedication and patience. Through their approach to transitional justice, our professors taught us more than we knew there was to learn and gave us guidance so that we could be sufficiently rooted to help each other and to help others. Of course, they also helped us reach a thesis proposal that did not involve a thousand page book about the history of humanity. For many of us, this master's program was the first time we were in class not only to listen, but also to speak and be heard. And this is the type of experience that no textbook can offer. This program taught us how to debate respectfully, how to argue clearly, how to write quickly and with quality, how to read productively. But more than anything, it prepared us for our upcoming endeavors because it taught us how to learn. We learned that transitional justice is not a walk in the park. Truth, justice, reparations, and guarantees of non-recurrence are simply possible tools we can use in our work, but they are no miracle. The more we learn, and as so many TJ scholars have stated, the more we realize that there is no perfect transition, no approach that is sufficiently respectful of both local and international standards, no tribunal in which all victims will be heard, and no reparations program that will repair all the harm left in the aftermath of atrocities and authoritarian regimes. The more we studied, the more we felt that guarantees of non-recurrence and reconciliation between divided societies sounded like unrealistic and childish dreams. However, the tools and guidelines and case studies we researched throughout the year showed us that in every case, in every single case, a well-founded attempt to achieve justice can make a difference in the life of one survivor or one affected person. And as we leave the academy, our job is to continue to work so that at least some justice and some reparations are achieved for an increasingly large number of people. After this intense year, it has been clear that despite our acutely different backgrounds, we all have something in common, and that is our gut-motivated connection to our work, which Gibran Khalil Gibran has called love. It is what we have lapidated this past year, and it is what we hope to never lose. We have learned about societal transitions while to a greater or lesser extent, our own transitions were taking place. Tensions and challenges will never cease, but this program has pushed us to grow into a better version of ourselves, a version which we are proud to bear, and which, we will, and which will always somehow reflect, even if unconsciously, in every future step we take. Today, we celebrate our graduation, a milestone between our past and our present. But we also remember our responsibility to never work half-heartedly and to never bake a bread, which we know will, from the start, fill but half a man's hunger. Our responsibility is to put our even seemingly unimportant brick into the construction of the world we strive for. And this master's program has given us the tool to do so. May a new journey begin. Thank you, and congratulations to the NTJ class of 2020. Thank you, Anna, for this profound and moving 
talk. We really appreciate that. Now we have Rabah. Rabah from the Executive Master, Rama Al Juma. You have the floor. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I sincerely hope all of you are well and keeping safe in these challenging times. Upon receiving the invitation to graduation ceremony, I insisted on traveling to be here in person despite the distance and difficulties faced. Unfortunately, as you all know, the graduation has been canceled. Nevertheless, I truly believe in the importance of celebrating achievement. By celebrating, one gives attention to the transcendent meaning of his or her action. By celebrating, we are active and we are acknowledge the power we have on our action, on our life, on our future. This has never been truer than in the midst of the current hardship brought forward by COVID-19. The pandemic has, in my view, reaffirmed the importance of this executive master's program. More specifically, as COVID-19 spread around the world, international actors such as the United Nations have called for a stop to armed conflict to facilitate efforts to fight the pandemic. On 23 March 2020, the Secretary General of the United, uh, United Nations, Antonio Guterres, called for a global ceasefire to create corridors for life-saving aid to open breaches window for diplomacy, to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 among vulnerable population in our own town countries. Also, one could argue that the severe negative economic consequences resulting from pandemic have expansion, exponentially intensified armed conflict by facilitating opposition movement, as is sadly evidenced by the recent regional conflict in the remote separatist enclave of Nagarno, Karabakh, it also appears that the pandemic has brought a dampening effect on the conflict in certain war-torn countries such as Libya, Syria, and Yemen, where international parties are attempting, as we speak, to leverage the life-threatening impact of COVID-19 to limit casualty support. To quote you and Secretary General Guterres, the fury of the virus illustrates the folly of war. Why is this relevant? Because also there is a significant concern that the severe negative economic consequence resulting from pandemic will worsen certain root causes of armed conflict, such as unemployment, inequalities, and social stigma. I hope that it may also provide an unprecedented window of opportunity to put an end to certain conflict by forcing individuals to reassess why they are fighting. As UN Under Secretary General for Political and Peace Building Appear, Rosemary A. Di Carlo, accurately stated with regard to Libya, if anyone incredibly still needed a reason to stop fighting, this is it. Let's hope that from the devastation of COVID-19 will rise hope for a peace. I joined this program to a better understand the issue at play and the root causes of armed conflicts, to a better support and provide the humanitarian aid, and relief for those in need. I truly believe this program has allowed me to get a better grasp on these issues and will open many doors going forward. It is with a great pleasure and honor that I stand before you today, representing my executive master's classmates to thank all professors and executive master's team for their great support and contribution. I also want to give a special thank to Mr. Yahya, the previous head delegate of Red Cross in Kuwait, who initially supported me to study at Academy, as well as my supervisor, Professor Robert Cole, whom without, I would not have completed my thesis earlier than expected and presented my defense in person in March prior to the lockdown. To my parents, my husband, and my daughters, I thank you for your everlasting support and love. My fellow graduates, today marks an important day of our life, and I hope we can all achieve what we can, what we came here for. It's now a time to celebrate our achievement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabah, for your excellent speech. Now I'm happy to introduce uh, Professor Marco Sassoli, our former director, who will give the keynote speech. Marco, you have the floor. Thank you. 
Bonsoir et félicitations, mais n'ayez pas peur, je ne vais pas continuer en français. Obviously, our students, after more than one year in Geneva, would now perfectly understand French, but uh, the families and friends who are very important this evening uh, did not necessarily, or only very few of them, uh, live in Geneva and therefore uh, I will speak in English. So congratulations to um, our students, to the families of our students, to the friends of our students, and also somehow to the teachers and teaching assistants, because um, it is also, we have always the illusion that we also contributed to, to this success. Thank you also to uh, Director Gajori to give me this opportunity to uh, pronounce a keynote speech. And uh, me too, I regret very much that we cannot meet uh, in person uh, because it's always so interesting to meet parents, friends of students with whom uh, you worked for one year and also to meet the students uh, who now are no longer students but graduates of the academy. Now this was a particularly difficult year and uh, I want and therefore you deserve particular congratulations. Um, you did not get a discounted diploma but your success is more worse than in previous years because you had to get it under more difficult circumstances. Uh, certainly in March, uh, all the teaching went online. Um, and as a former director, I would really like to personally thank you that you remained committed and did not panic in this difficult situation, you have shown solidarity, cohesion, responsibility, and creativity. Somehow, to see the good side, this is a good preparation for working in transitional justice and humanitarian emergency situations, because uh, you lived in emergency situation and the uncertainty which is so typical for people living affected by transitional justice and uh, humanitarian emergency situations. A special thanks to uh, the Students' Council. I think we were very lucky to have the best Students' Council we had until now when we needed most uh, a good uh, student's counsel. Now, I have also to express my admiration uh, because when I read, at least at the LLM and for some uh, uh, at the executive master, your exams, I considered that uh, such a brilliant legal way of arguing uh, could have led you to earn much more money in another field of law or international law, but you chose uh, the fields of humanitarian law, human rights, international criminal law and transitional justice because you believe that it is your task to change the life of uh, most vulnerable people and you will draw satisfaction from that. Now, most of you, for most of you, no, I would say for all of you, international law will not be everything you must know in your professional life. Uh, it will be only part of it. Um, Many will tell you that international law is only a means to achieve better protection of human beings and to facilitate humanitarian action. 
And they are right, but not totally right in my view, because law is also present when no humanitarian is present, when no international is present, when no monitor is present. It is present as soon as a beneficiary needs it. Law may perform different functions when it is invoked and some even when it is not. But I think it's very important uh, to invoke it because that's the starting point to uh, take away subjectivity and selectivity. It is not simply something you learned in Geneva and uh, a kind of religious sect in Geneva invented. No, it is a common heritage of mankind, better in French, héritage commun de l'humanité, because it, humanity and mankind is the same word uh, in French. Humanitarian action, in my view, is not simply about carving out a deal and having good relations. It is to achieve an ideal and to take it away from relativity and subjectivity. This is why parties, many humanitarians and internationals, do not like reference to law. I personally, when I worked as protection coordinator in the former Yugoslavia for the ICSC, the deputy high representative, a German ambassador, hated me because I was principled, because I tried to make rules be respected while he simply wanted to conclude deals and he did not succeed while the women of Srebrenica offered me a carpet which I still cherish very much. Now the functions of law. Uh, obviously law allows you to monitor its respect. It's a guideline for your own action in implementing it and uh, I'm sure you will not forget that the law is not only addressed to others but also to you and you should be the first to comply with it. Um, it allows training of prospective possible perpetrators and of victims in the idea of an empowerment of the victims if they know their rights, which is obviously sometimes more useful than in other situations. Personally, I think to train uh, Palestinians in Gaza about how uh, the Israeli Air Force should bomb them is not very much uh, useful, but will rather um, uh, contribute to, to frustration. Law allows to make a preventive appeal for its respect. It's an argument for some of you for access to the conflict victims. It's an argument in negotiations on the behavior of belligerents. It allows you to require an inquiry into and allows you to ask for the repression of individual violations. It allows you to condemn based on objective factors, uh, violations, and it is a reference in negotiations with third states and the international community requiring for their support in humanitarian law under Article 1 Common of the Geneva Conventions for human rights law because human rights obligations are erga omnes obligations. Even when international law is uh, not explicitly mentioned, it is important. Uh, if you mention a rule even without reference to its source, say, if you say this person has been tortured, in my experience, only a few people will ask, okay, um, what's the legal basis of your assertion? And it is often sufficient to present simply the facts, but the facts are very important to seriously and accurately determine the facts. And then 
asked some questions. Now, even as a means, and as I told you in my view, it is not only a means, it must be used judicially, judiciously. Don't abuse it, even for a good cause. And here, I know that not everyone will agree with me, because those who see it purely as a means will say, okay, if I abuse of it of a, for a good cause, and I'm successful, then law had served its functions. Well, I think it necessarily weakens the credibility of the law and its protecting power if, if even those who uh, plead for a better world abuse it, because it justifies somehow the abuse by those who want to escape from the basic uh, obligations. And therefore, I would appeal to you to give you just two examples. When patients are arrested uh, in a hospital, this is not a violation of international humanitarian law. And don't say it is a violation of humanitarian law. Uh, but nevertheless, argue that this is a very bad idea because it means that rebels will no longer go to the hospital to benefit from their right, the right of all the wounded to be cared for. And similarly, uh, don't say, as a famous international lawyer and practitioner recently said, even in the Geneva Academy, that um, the violation of the obligation to report um, medical treatment is a violation of humanitarian law. Unfortunately, it is not. And if you say that this is a violation, then you, um, uh, you treat it as an attack against the hospital, which is a violation of humanitarian law. But again, uh, insist nevertheless on your ideals even when they are not reflected in the law. Simply don't claim it's the law. Now, in our branches, most of you will not be mere attorneys defending a client. Obviously, if you work uh, as uh, a defense counsel before the International Criminal you have to defend your client. But in most cases, you will also be members of the invisible court adjudicating laws which have no court because most of our branches never end up unfortunately in court so you are part of the court and as director gajoli said you are the alum together with all the other alumni of the academy you are often the final court I would appeal to you to resist um, to a pure instrumentalization of the law and to detrimental interpretations. You do not risk your life, only your career, popularity, or the next assessment by your supervisor if you stand by the law. How can you criticize those following superior orders in an armed conflict if you follow just the group atmosphere in your future employers? Now, obviously, it is not so easy for lawyers to stand their point and by the law. Lawyers who are, on the one hand, lawyers who are too popular with the non-lawyers they advise are useless because uh, if you always just find a justification for uh, those you advise, somehow they don't need your advice. While unfortunately, on the other hand, lawyers who are too unpopular with those they advise have no impact. Um, if you always uh, object to what they want to do, on the long run, they will no longer consult you. So you cannot always resist. 
you cannot always uphold the law and your principles, but make an effort and prioritize and stand sometimes and in important cases by what you learned and what are your convictions and belief after this, this year of study in the academy. Don't adapt too quickly to an institutional culture. I must say I had several students who were very progressive and kindly because um, I find all our students are always kind. Let me know that somehow I had a too positivistic approach to international law. But three years later, the same students, after having worked in an organization or with a government, uh, they considered me to be an uncontrollable loose cannon and a human rights militant. Obviously, nevertheless, question your opinions and be ready to change your opinion. Remain critical and sceptical, but never cynical and disillusioned. And if you are disillusioned, change branch, become a back bankruptcy lawyer. You know, bankruptcy law is very important. And there, perhaps, if you are disillusioned from the branches you studied here, you can find again something you believe in. I find the the most difficult thing to stand is people who work in the humanitarian field and become cynical. Also, one can often have reasons to become cynical. And I would suggest <coughs> if you become a manager and many of you will manage other people, don't take your interns and junior staff illusions away too easily. Uh, you know, the realism, they will learn it. Uh, don't destroy the, you, the, their ideals too much. Think back to you, the time of your studies and perhaps you will better understand them. And I would suggest not to lie, not to defend opinions which are the opposite of yours. Now, I must admit that uh, I do not favor this with my teaching method because for those who, uh, to whom I did not teach, um, I try to discuss cases and uh, poor students at the LLM even could not choose whether they were pleading for Israel or Palestine. Uh, I believe that this is more efficient for the training uh, than telling you what I think is the truth. But it is important that when you do not plead before a fictitious tribunal, like in the LLM class, or before a real tribunal, where obviously you have to plead in favor of a client, that then you also defend the law and you don't defend what is unlawful. So finally, to uh, sum up, try to remain a human being. Law is not everything, but law can help. And please don't abuse of the law, even for the most noble causes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sassoli. We will cherish that advice of uh, having a principled approach of the law and to stay true to ourselves. Thank you. And now I give the floor to Mr. Roger Durand, who is the president of the Orizuna Prize Foundation, and he's going to announce who won the 2020 Henry Dunant Prize. So Mr. Durand, you have the floor. Peace. 
Mr. Durand, you are muted. We don't hear you yet. Mr. Durand, can you unmute yourself? Great. Est-ce que vous m'entendez maintenant? Très bien. Ah, parfait. Merci. Madame la directrice, éminents professeurs, chers étudiantes, chers étudiants, mesdames et messieurs, chers amis, tout d'abord, je vous prie de m'excuser, je vais parler en français parce que c'est une langue qui existe encore à Genève, qui est une langue aussi de culture et qui était la langue d'Henri Dunant. Mais si vous ne comprenez pas ce message, nous vous l'enverrons volontiers en anglais. Euh, il suffit d'en exprimer la demande au siège de l'Académie. Comme vous êtes tous d'éminents spécialistes du droit international et des droits humains, vous savez que Henri Dunant est un personnage fondateur. Vous savez qu'il fut non seulement le fondateur de la Croix-Rouge, mais aussi le principal initiateur de la Convention de Genève, signée le 22 août 1864, qui marque le point de départ du droit international humanitaire contemporain. En 1998 déjà, la société Henri Dunant, qui est donc une société d'historiens, de membres de la famille et de cadres du mouvement humanitaire, a créé un cadre pour qu'on puisse étudier plus profondément et qu'on puisse mieux diffuser l'image, mais surtout la vie et l'œuvre d'Henri Dunant. Pour cela, nous organisons des colloques, des, colloques, des publications, des rencontres, nous posons des plaques commémoratives, nous installons des bustes, mais surtout nous collaborons avec l'Académie de droit international, humanitaire et de droits humains. Il est important de rappeler que c'est une arrière petite nièce d'Henri Dunant, Madame Pierrette Mourgedalgue, membre de notre comité, qui avait eu l'idée de fonder cette fondation et qui par sa générosité, nous a permis de constituer le capital initial de la Fondation. Selon ces statuts, la Fondation Prix Henri Dunant a pour objectif, je cite, de récompenser un travail académique exceptionnel qui contribue à l'approfondissement, au rayonnement et au renouvellement des idéaux humanitaire et philanthropique d'Henri Dunant par le droit. Le prix Henri Dunant recherche est décerné chaque année depuis 2005 en partenariat avec l'Académie de droit international humanitaire et de droits humains. Et d'ailleurs, j'ai le plaisir de dire que votre directrice avait reçu un accessi il y a plusieurs années. Et pour moi, c'est un grand plaisir de la revoir déjà euh, sur l'écran. En pratique, l'Académie fait une première sélection parmi les travaux de diplôme d'études supérieures afin d'identifier les meilleurs travaux en termes académiques pour ceux qui, par leur sujet, répondent aux critères d'attribution du prix. Les travaux retenus sont ensuite soumis à un jury qui est composé de cinq personnes, deux professeurs de l'Académie, un représentant du Comité international de la Croix-Rouge et deux membres du Conseil de la Fondation du Prix Henri Dunant. Cette année, les membres du jury ont reçu trois mémoires de diplôme sélectionnés par les professeurs de l'Académie, tous trois d'une excellente facture. Permettez-moi de saisir cette occasion pour remercier très chaleureusement les professeurs de l'Académie pour le soin qu'ils ont apporté à cette sélection, remercier votre directrice pour l'impulsion qu'elle donne à notre collaboration et aussi remercier Dani Diogo qui est la, on pourrait dire la cheville ouvrière logistique et qui nous aide aussi beaucoup. Après avoir examiné ces travaux, avec toute l'attention requise à la lumière des critères d'attribution du prix, les membres du jury 
ont décidé, par une décision unanime, de décerner le prix Henri Dunant Recherche 2020 à Madame Yulia Mogutova pour son mémoire « Mend the Gap » Right to life of state-owned military personnel in conduct of hostilities. Je vous propose tous d'applaudir maintenant, euh, de loin, quand même. Les membres du jury ont considéré que Madame Mogutova s'était attaquée à un sujet difficile, la question de la protection du droit à la vie des membres des forces armées par rapport à l'État dans les forces armées duquel ils servent. Traditionnellement, en effet, le droit humanitaire a été conçu dans les rapports entre un État et les membres des forces armées ou de la population civile de l'État ennemi. Le mémoire de Mme Mogutova rappelle, en revanche, qu'un individu ne perd pas le droit le bénéfice des droits de l'homme lorsqu'il s'enrôle ou lorsqu'il est enrôlé dans les forces armées de son pays. Elle relève en outre que la clause dite de Martens fait entrer les droits de l'homme dans le champ du droit humanitaire. Ainsi, le mémoire de Madame Mogutova projette un éclairage original sur la question essentielle et d'une grande actualité l'articulation entre le droit humanitaire et les droits de l'homme. Le lien avec l'héritage moral et spirituel d'Henri Dunant est évident. En effet, la vie des soldats a été au cœur d'un des premiers combats d'Henri Dunant dès la bataille de Solferino. Pour toutes ces raisons, les membres du jury ont constaté que le mémoire de Madame Mogutova était dans le droit fil d'un des premiers combats d'Henri Dunant, celui qui l'a fait entrer dans l'histoire. Ils ont donc décidé à l'unanimité de désigner Madame Mogutova comme la lauréate du prix Henri Dunant Recherche 2020. Cher Yulia Mogutova, je vous vois dans une des fenêtres et naturellement vous souriez et je me réjouis de pouvoir vous transmettre directement les félicitations du jury et surtout de vous remettre le diplôme une fois en main propre à l'académie dès que cette terrible pandémie nous permettra de nous rencontrer. Félicitations et à très bientôt, je l'espère. Distinguished members of Henri Dunant Foundation, dear professors and teaching assistants of the Geneva Academy, dear colleagues and friends, it's a great honor for me to receive the Henri Dunant Prize in Research, not only because it's a privilege to know that my work was appreciated by the jury members, but also because I owe a lot both personally and professionally to the International Committee of the Red Cross that has been created due to the efforts of Henri Dunant and where I spent three fantastic years of my life before coming to the Geneva Academy. The topic of my LLM paper was dedicated to a very specific subject, which is the right to life of state's own military personnel in the conduct of hostilities. I came up with this idea being inspired by Professor Gajoli and Professor Sassoli, who have been always been insisting on the practical implication of applicable norms and complementarity between IHL and human rights. When working with the ICRC, I have clearly understood that human suffering does not have race, religion, gender or profession. That the world is not black and white, and especially when it comes to an armed conflict. And what is most importantly, that prevention of atrocities is always more efficient than the subsequent persecution. Henri Dunant started his noble mission when he organized relief for the wounded soldiers on the battlefields uh, of Solferino. For more than the combat, 
prisoners of war, as well as limiting means and methods of warfare in conduct of hostilities. All this is to ensure that the enemy is treated with dignity and humanity, and that no adverse distinction is acceptable in humanitarian action. My idea was to go a little bit further and to see what are the obligations of the states towards its own military. When discussing the human rights of soldiers, the drama is that the starting point of this discussion is never a legal argument, but rather moral considerations. Because at the end of the day, I don't think I will be mistaken if I say that soldiers are seen rather as perpetrators for once and the heroes for the others. They are rarely considered as the right beholders and even less as the victims of violations. Neither I will be wrong if I suggest that for many people there is no such a thing as the right to life for soldiers. They do go to the battlefields knowing that they will probably never come back. They do sacrifice their lives for their motherland. However, this by no means should relieve the state of its human rights obligations that it owes to its own nationals. In the first part of my paper, I analyzed the international and domestic human rights jurisprudence to demonstrate that firstly, the state does have specific obligations under the right to life towards its own army. I came to the conclusion that the state has um, specific obligations to protect the life of its soldiers, both in peacetime and in armed conflicts. And that proper training and equipment of servicemen is the core of these obligations. The main idea was not to create an unrealistic burden for the state, but to show that only some obligations can be interpreted in the light of particularities of the military service. While the others, such as, for example, the obligation to investigate suspicious deaths or alleged violations of the right to life, has no contextual interpretation. In the second part of my paper, I turned on to the IHL norms to see whether this protective human rights discourse can actually coexist with the pragmatic rules of armed conflicts. Coming back to the cardinal principle of humanity and the Martin's Clause, I try to demonstrate that the protection of state's own army is not foreign to IHL, and that the respect for humanity and human dignity does not have any nationality test. Then I showed that the protection of the life of combatants is part and parcel of co contemporary IHL, and that it is inherent in the principle of military necessity and the norms limiting the means and methods of warfare. However, here I identify the legal gap in protection. The norms governing the conduct of hostilities focus only on the protection of the enemy, and they stay silent when it comes to the protection of the state's own armed forces. This is where the human rights should come into play. The most intriguing part was the practical implications of such further humanization of armed conflicts. My principal goal was to show that there is a direct dependence between protection of human rights of the military and their subsequent behavior in the battlefield. At the same time, IHL is well equipped to prevent possible misuse of human rights arguments by states. Thus, I came to the conclusion that including compulsory human rights component in the military training would enhance general compliance with IHL and human rights in armed conflicts. The soldiers who are well trained and equipped and know that their state protects their right to life will be more likely to have mercy for the enemy and respect the law. And I would like to finish by expressing my sincere gratitude to all the professors and teaching assistants of the Geneva Academy, and in particular to Professor Gaggioli for being a tremendously supportive and encouraging supervisor for my LLM paper, helping me to navigate in this very complex topic. I would also like to thank Professor Sassoli, uh, whose IHL classes have always been intellectually challenging and extremely inspiring. My family, who despite this very difficult and surreal year, has always been the greatest support I could ever ask for. And finally, to people I love, and to my friends in Geneva and abroad, and especially to Berta, Melina, Sirhat, Fabrizio, and Juan, without whom this year would have never been so special.
And congratulations to all of us. Even in global pandemics, we made it. Alors, merci beaucoup, uh, Yulia, d'avoir accepté de faire uh, cette vidéo uh, qui nous permettra aussi de faire connaître le contenu de votre uh, mémoire à une plus grande audience parce qu'on va pouvoir mettre ça sur nos, uh, nos réseaux. J'en profite aussi pour remercier M. Durand pour son introduction uh, au prix et pour vous dire aussi à quel point il est important pour l'Académie uh, d'avoir ce prix, de pouvoir le le donner à, à, à nos étudiants, euh, cela vraiment démontre la qualité et l'excellence euh, de, de nos programmes de master et puis des mémoires qui peuvent être produits. Donc, merci encore de notre part à nous tous. Maintenant, j'ai le plaisir d'annoncer quel est le meilleur mémoire de LLM et le meilleur mémoire du MTJ. So, I'm happy to announce the best LLM paper and the best MTJ paper. So first, I'll start with the best LLM paper, which has been afforded to Berta fernandez Rosson for the topic, The Sexual Nature of Violence, an Obstacle or an Opportunity to Enhance the Visibility of Male Victimhood at the ICC. Berta, would you like to say a few words? Dear professors, colleagues, families and friends, I would like to express my gratitude to professors and members of the Geneva Academy for recognizing my LLM paper with this award. This year has been challenging for many reasons, but I found in the Academy and in my classmates and friends a warm environment to face this new paradigm. I would like to start by inviting you to think of an image of a victim of sexual violence. Most likely, a woman or a girl has come to your mind. Perhaps a very few of you have actually thought of a man strength, aggressivity, sexual dominance, these are the traits expected from men by prevailing social scripts, all of them conducing to an imaginary under which male sexual victimization is almost an oxymoron. Men and boys are seen as potential sexual perpetrators, invulnerable themselves to sexual violence, and even when men are victimized, the violence they suffer is mainly seen as physical, political, but never sexual. These societal beliefs penetrate the legal arena and in particular international criminal jurisprudence. Judicial actors have unquestionably recognized acts of genital mutilation as sexual violence when perpetrated against women. Yet, if performed against men, these acts have been systematically categorized under non-sexual labels such as torture or inhuman acts. Quite recently, for instance, male victims took a step forward in the Kenyatta case before the International Criminal Court. They broke strong stigmas and claimed that they had suffered sexual violence in the form of genital mutilation. The chamber, however, rejected the classification of those episodes of genital violence as sexual violence, arguing that the acts did not have a sexual nature. The court then classified them as inhuman acts. Although the sexual nature element was crucial in this ruling, the chamber failed to provide any definition whatsoever of this term. The silence of the judges in the chamber was also echoed by the Rome study itself, the elements of crimes, domestic legislation, and even academic writings. No definition exists of the sexual nature element. No test is available to conclusively determine what converts an act of violence into an act of sexual violence. And it is precisely as a consequence of this legal vacuum that gendered and stereotyped understandings of sexual violence keep denying men their victimhood. But there is a still hope from a legal perspective. If we are able to collectively agree on an inclusive definition of the sexual nature element, we can start effectively combating the under-recognition of sexual violence against men. This was the ultimate objective of my LLM paper, where I propose a new conceptualization of the term. My contribution in this paper is twofold. On the one hand, I make a conceptual proposal of the term in four consecutive steps. And on the other hand, I suggest a methodological proposal consisting of a double track test to guide judicial actors whenever they have to assess whether an act of violence can be considered an act of sexual violence. At the end of my paper, I also call judicial actors to understand sexual violence against men as a subtype of a gender-based violence, 
rejecting the understanding that only male versus female violence can be explained in terms of gender. Now, to conclude my presentation, I would like to convey my appreciation to Professor Gaeta, who guided me throughout the supervision, and especially to my family and friends who have been patiently listening to me all those countless occasions in which I was just like so excited to discuss everything I was discovering. So thank you all, and especially to my honey badgers. Fantastic, thank you very much, Berta, and congratulations again. So now I'm happy to announce the best MTJ paper. It is with Camila Ruiz Segovia for the thesis entitled Sin las familias no, victim participation and the fight against impunity in the search for missing persons in Mexico. Camila, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Dear community, I wanted to start by thanking my mentors at the Geneva Academy, Frank, Clara, and particularly Thomas. I also wanted to thank Lucy Diaz. She is the mother of Luis Guillermo, who went missing in 2013 in Mexico. This past year, she shared her wisdom and strength with me and helped me a lot uh, in the writing of this paper. Uh, my paper is a case study on the situation of missing persons in Mexico and on what I believe is a developing grassroots transitional justice effort in my home country. Since the beginning of the war on drugs in Mexico and in the context of the sharp rise in cases of missing persons that have come with it, the families of those who have disappeared have been at the forefront of the efforts to locate their relatives. In spite of numerous challenges, posed both by a fragile security situation and also by limited state resources. I have had the honor to witness the search for truth of these families since 2014, and I have always felt a profound sense of admiration for their work. For me, writing this paper was a unique opportunity to uplift the voices of the families of the missing and to bring attention to their stories. In particular, I was interested in shedding light on the powerful effects that the participation of the families have in reducing impunity in our justice system. My paper introduces the argument that the active participation of victims can increase the possibilities of success of truth-seeking mechanisms, including those that are geared towards the search for missing persons. Victims, including the families of the missing, can help ensure that authorities are accountable and that they fulfill their obligation by continuously exerting pressure and by actively engaging in the design and implementation of truth and justice mechanisms. By bringing forward this argument, my paper suggests that victim participation should be an essential component of transitional justice, not only because of its presumed benefits for victims, but also because it can help strengthen state accountability and combat impunity. In some ways, the efforts of the families of the missing in Mexico are not different from those of other families in transitional justice settings across the region. Like in Argentina, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Peru, the active participation of the families of the missing is above all motivated by their firm desire to find their relatives. This desire has turned into action in the context of a period of mass human rights violations in Mexico. It is unclear how long it will take the Mexican government to fully redress the situation of missing persons in the country. Given the magnitude of the crisis, it might take years, if not decades. But what is certain is that the families of the missing will continue ensuring that the truth is uncovered. In their their restless efforts to find the truth, they have become human rights defenders and make an and a remarkable contribution to the fight against impunity in Mexico. Once again, I would like to thank my mentors at the Geneva Academy, my friends and my family for the support, their support throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations, Camila. Thank you. And now we are reaching the last part of this ceremony with the actual graduation. So I will say the names of all, all of you who managed to get the diploma. So let's start with the LLM in International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. So I'm happy to announce that with 
the honor summa cum laude, meaning excellent, we have de la Bourdonnaye, Thibault, Fernandez Rosson, Berta, Fidelis Tsuru, Melina, Janssens, Pauline, Kitching, Rakael, Mogutova, Julia, Osturk, Serhat, Raffaelli, Virginia. Now we have Magna Cum Laude, très bien. Borden, Lisa, Kaski, Christopher, François Blouin, Juliette, Jacari, Chiara, Hamza, Marichette, Padin, Juan. Congratulations. <laughs> now Cum Laude, we have Bargava, Shubangi, Chauvet, Chanel, Elfimova, Natalia, Farouke Muhammad, Fontaine, Pagé, Sarah, Gourier, Madeleine, Grande, Viviana, Copeca, Helena, Locuratolo, Fabrizio, Munoz, Quintero, Juana, Nazirumbi, Stella. <coughs> And lastly, last but not least, Agu, Chemelie, Dwey, Ruba, Farias, Balesteros, Jacqueline, Haji Alan, Kaur Jaski Ranjit, Lopez Sanchez Fernanda, Nor Jabarti, Polia Natasha, and Saliani Hab Ava. Congrats! <laughs> Now, for the Master in Transitional Justice, Human Rights, and the Rule of Law, we have. Summa cum laude, Kais Ramzi, Svenfeld Karina. Congratulations! Bravo, Ramzi! <laughs> Then, magna cum laude, we have Andalib Gazal, Cor Cordanego Catunian Anna, Fiscus dos Zoe, Gutler Yvonne, Ge Jessica. Kouashvili Nana, Kurak Bayeva Dinara, Mantilla Rad Diana, Martignoni Vittoria, Nayer Amrita, Nunez Pastor Mayra, Rajasingam Amira, Ruiz Segovia Camila, Trigozo Ibanez Andrea del Carmen, Vole Charlotte, Vani Gaba Bunge Sonali. Sorry for that. Congrats! <laughs> Cum laude, we have Baz Emma, Chepkvoni Nancy, Hajar Yasmin, Kainazarova Cholpon, Sadriu Valza, Samra Kinda, Vang Bendi. Congratulations! Now we go for the Executive Master in International Law in Armed Conflict. So from the year 2016-2018, we have Mujali Julie. Then from 2017 until 2019, we have Abasi Sher Alam, Almar Tsuki Zaed, Chetam Stella, Mohamed Chahinda, Ofozu Apia Jafet, Sorensen Karina, Villemier Sarah, Vitro Erika, Zlenko Anatoly. Congrats! <laughs> From 2018 until 2020, we have Aljuma Raba. Bouchard Luc, Cleland Ramses, Fage Clementine, Carlson Ivan, Mortopoulos Constantinos, Ntrakva Alexander, Ortiz Alexandra, Pirizi Alessandro, Ruiz Gayol Diego, Somlaba Mfo. Congratulations! <laughs> 
So now I can really congratulate all of you. I'm happy to tell you that uh, next week we are going to send the diplomas and so you should receive them uh, very soon. I would like to thank all our speakers for the tremendous speeches. I would like to congratulate you once again. And last but not least, I would like to warmly thank Danny Diogo, that was the coordinator of the master's programs because he organized first an in-person ceremony, then he had to de-organize the in-person ceremony and organize an online ceremony. So I would like really to, to thank him and to thank all of you for your attendance, participation and motivation. Good luck, take care and stay well. Bye and cheers. Enjoy, celebrate now with your families. Bravo. Bye. Mabruk Ramzi, we love you. Where are your parents? Bravo, Mira. Congratulations.